Right. Okay, welcome to the College of Complexes. Uh, my name is Don, and, um, and I'll be the moderator this evening. Now, we're going, to have a, um, we're going to have a very special presentation tonight. Let me just set this, this microphone down here. Um, let me grab, 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 the, um, grab the program. Okay. Predictions for the next predictions for the next hundred years. Tim Boulder and Charles Paydock will present uh, their findings and present the results of a survey taken among the faculty and students of the College of Complexes with pow with a PowerPoint presentation. So college um, okay. So oh, and also college regulars will be asked to present their personal predictions concerning changes in the world they think will take place, whether these are societal, economic, geopolitical, scientific, or cultural. So my understanding is first, Charlie's going to speak first, and then uh, uh, Joe Meyer is going to speak very briefly, and then Tim is going to come up and give his predictions. And is there going to be any other anybody else besides them, Charlie? Uh, oh, okay, and also Mike Wintour is also going to speak. And, uh, yes, yes. Oh, and uh, Li Ping Yuan is also going to speak. Yes. Yeah. So, um, all right, now let me just, I see we got a lot of new faces. Uh, uh, we got a lot of new faces tonight. So, um, so I'm going to explain very briefly how the college works. First of all, um, First of all, the, uh, there's a, the college charges a $3 tuition this, uh, uh, for attendance e each night. Uh, and uh, uh, Brown Basford, our treasurer, is uh, over there, and he's collecting the tuition. So if you haven't paid already, go see him, or he will come around and ask you for money. Uh, now, in addition to the $3 tuition, this restaurant, the Lincoln Restaurant, will also charge you uh, $5 plus tax uh, just for breathing the oxygen in here, uh, even if you don't eat anything. So you might as well order something to eat. Uh, now, now uh, I mentioned very briefly what our format is. Before we get into the lecture, we're going to have uh, we'll have some announcements from the community, and then after that, we'll have our speakers: Charlie, Joe Meyer, um, and and Tim, and also uh, and also uh, Mike Wintort and Lee Ping Yuan. Um, after that, we'll have a question and answer session uh, for the speakers, uh, and during. During the Q&A session, that is a time for questions, not for speeches. Uh, after that, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period, for which the College of Complexes is, is uh, justly infamous. And that, at that time, anybody, anybody in the restaurant can come over here to the podium, to the microphone, and, and, and make as big a... Make about have about five minutes to make as big a fool out of themselves as they want. Like doing that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, right now, after that, after that, the speaker, uh, our speakers will have the final word. Uh, now, the, the restaurant closes at 11 o'clock, so we have to be out of here by 11. Uh, now, we don't have this is a freedom of speech form, so we don't have a whole lot of rules here. We have two very important rules however what are they well first of all one fool at a time so that means so persons inter persons who interrupt the speaker will be reminded of the rule one fool at a time now the second our second rule is no personal attacks yeah and that goes for you too charlie you read that again okay uh, by the way with this is this is being this is being uh, video. This is being recorded on camera. Um, we have a camera over here, and uh, but without any further ado, no. let's get. All right. In that case, uh, let's have a warm round of applause for our first speaker, Charles Paydock. All right. I'm not going to turn the lights out here. Um, and we did this a number of years ago. We had predictions for the coming year. But I said, looking at the, you know, the, the depth of thought at the College of Complexes, I said, there should be no challenge for us to figure out what's going to happen for the next century. The only thing I do ask at this information here, if you promise that we're giving you this information, that you use it only for the good of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> that includes training. I, uh, all right, I tried to, I'll, I'll just tell you this, I tried, to, I'm eclectic as usual, and I try to stay away from technology as much as I can. That's kind of a given. 
But anyhow, we've got a couple presenters, so uh, let's see here which way. All right, we got to figure out what will be the consequences, and most importantly, what adjustments are we, I guess I have to stand aside because you can't see. Uh, what adjustments are we going to make? And there's the change master there himself. Uh, just to begin, uh, pin head size cameras are going to be everywhere. And security is going to be a, a feature of our lives. Uh, if you look here, that's a mannequin in a store. We were talking about that last week. And the little eyes are watching you. And there's a pen, much like I have here, which you can only have a conversation with your boss and then promising you a raise, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, one of the things we came across, the concept of privateness. Privacy is not really in the Constitution. It's implied in the Bill of Rights, but there's no right of privacy. Nevertheless, it's going to become passe uh, with surveillance technology and rise of websites like YouTube. I understand that there are about 20 hours of YouTube video posted every minute, 20 or 25 hours. It's actually there's, every second. Is it? Every, every second. There's more YouTube and videos on the internet than in the 60 years of television production. Mm -hmm. And it's growing every day. But 65,000 video uploads daily here. Wow. So the idea of privacy, and we'll get a little further into this. Okay, this is just the house I came across on the West Coast, I thought there, there were little efforts there to achieve privacy. Oh, by the way, I threw in a bunch of my own photos, because I know I never get to show these to people. I shoot thousands of them. But you're a captive audience, and there's nothing you can do about it. But anyhow, I, I came across the neighborhood. They had all of these. These are all about, I should have had something to scale it. They're all about 20, 25 feet high. I, I said, this is really a fortress here. Uh, it is in Portland or someplace. One of the things that's going to happen is you don't have to worry too much about privacy because there will be an end of identity as we know it. And you can read these things. We can create new identities ourselves. Uh, we'll have avatars in virtual reality. And they'll act on our behalf so you can have uh, anonymous uh, people uh, posting blogs, and I believe some people do this already. They remain anonymous and hidden. There's people on the college complex thing that think I don't know who their email address is. They send me nasty notes. Well, I know who you are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anyhow, we can. Uh, so even if, don't worry about the loss of privateness because just create a new identity act, you'll be okay. All right. Uh, we were talking a little bit there earlier as well here, being a union organizer. Uh, most of the people will spend the next century acquiring new skills. And your skills will become obsolete. I think the old adage was five years or something. Once you graduate, the skills you accrued in the academic setting are antiquated at that point. But this will be accelerated. And there'll be a lifeline uh, at any given moment. Uh, I've done this myself in my own little thing as a union organizer. I've never bypassed the course to maintain the cutting edge. And certain professions require this. But this is going to be a, fe a feature of the work life. If you think you get one job and you can relax, that's not going to happen. But don't worry, because you can put one of these things on your head. <laughs> <laughs> and simulate your brain for a little while, and you'll learn all those, well, you know, all the contents of a small public library of 30,000 volumes. So, uh, there you can see Marvin is his name. He's acquiring that. Maybe I should buy one of these for the college. With me. Anyhow, uh, the other thing about the people are, there's going to be super longevity. Our lifespans are going to increase. I think it's increasing on the average about two or three years every year. But 
this is going to make change your career choices. Realizing that you've got a longer period of time here, people are going to opt to stay in school longer, change careers, radical transitions. Oh, you made the wrong choice or in an area you don't care for. Anyhow, there's going to be a great, be great more fluidity in the workplace than we have today. I think it's also the demographics are changing. The old notion of getting a job, working that for 40 some years, uh, and retiring is changing. Uh, mobility, uh, things like that. So there's going to be a whole fluctuation here in that regard. Okay, now we'll get in a whole new area. Uh, we're going to start farming the oceans. And it's not going to be for fish. It's going to, we had a guy who spoke about this. He, he was going to grow algae. He said he could, matter of fact, he said if he ate his algae, he, that's all he ate. He said he could live a like hundred and some years just eating algae. But he spoke here at the college a few years ago. And we're also going to have to turn to the oceans because dust bowls are forming, one in Asia and one in Africa. Uh, as a result of global warming and climate change. That's, that's the given in it. These are just some photos of the ocean. I was thinking about fishing and all that. I was in San Francisco, so I threw in a few of my pictures here. Uh, anyhow, I think there was even a movie about this. I didn't see it. But the vast majority of business interactions are going to occur between, we're all going to have virtual personal assistants. <laughs> and uh, they're going to be doing most of our work for us in one fashion or another. You want to find a spot to sit down? All right. Um, to what extent does this? Uh, I think this is creeping already into, into our lives. Uh, transactions you can set up and things like that. Uh, and not and avoid this, let's say monthly bill payments and things like that. So electronically, they're gradually coming in. Where then we have robotics. By the way, we'll get into robots. These guys are the population is growing. There's already a million of them out there. At least one million robots. I was even amazed. They get in the shipping departments of factories. It's not just manufacturing. But we'll get a little more into robots here. Okay. Uh, this one's going to cause some problems. We're going to be able to control the weather, which may sound like a wonderful thing. Geoengineering, it's coming in. Uh, it's probably going to be imperative that we do this, engage in this. It's a hot topic right now. Uh, there's been some dark things that the military was doing this uh, years ago on the conspiracy pages. Uh, however, if you change the climate in your neighborhood, the adjoining neighborhood might not be too thrilled about that. Uh, so it's going to cause some uh, some incompatibility, to put it like that. Are you talking about HARP? H-A-A-R-P? Well, well, it's something that's alleged that controls the weather. Listen, this would be a question. question. Yeah, well, a good I don't know. We'll save it for question time. But, oh, there's some conspiracies on it. Yeah, I think, whoops. Hang the wrong way here. All right. Uh, I thought Ayala would be here, but um, what are things we're getting into? And there's a few more aspects to this. The human brain will be completely reversed engineered. And this can have dramatic effects. We're going to see a little bit later. Once we understand the cognitive abilities of human beings, uh, we can we can monitor human behavior in any fashion whatsoever and see some applications of that. Uh, this is kind of a fun one. There's gonna we're gonna probably destroy all nature. There ain't gonna be any of that love. And there's gonna be museums dedicated to the habitat of the world. I'm sorry, that we're just we're not we're not taking very we're not I was taking care of our little friends out there and our forest friends and things of that nature. So if you want, you know, stories about 
wildlife or something like this, you're going to have to go see a stuffed animal or something like that. Uh, this one might be a good one. Marriage contracts will be renewable once a year. It makes absolute sense to me. <laughs> you know, at the end of the year, you know, you know, you know, you know maybe this isn't working, honey, you know. <laughs> But I mean, put a terminal contract on this and uh, it can eliminate some things here. Oh, there's another intriguing one. I'm not a car owner, but there won't be any more automobile dealerships. Uh, everyone will purchase an automobile online. And what are those outfits? Car shop or whatever, CarX? Whatever. And FedEx even has ways of delivering cars. They'll pick up your car, fix it, and you know, whatever and so forth. So the automobile deal dealership as we know it will be non-existent. Um, being a transportation guy, let, this is happening right now. Uh, this is in progress. I believe, actually it's the young men, 18 to 25, there's a very low percentage of them own automobiles. And the figure's going down. I think these figures are even too high here. I think fewer and fewer people uh, are going to be, they, considering uh, parking years, what are they, for the next 75 years, they're going to be outrageously expensive. So people are going to look uh, towards uh, alternatives to, to the automobile here. Uh, okay, now I just wanted to throw this in one of my favorite slides of all the transit systems in the United States. There's CTA up there. You can see. These are going to be uh, expanding across the United States. It's even happening now. Uh, they're all putting in light rails, expanding lights, and things like that. There's, there's not, actually we're kind of unusual. Chicago's retrenching in its transit system, and every other city in the country, they're expanding it. There's at least seven male light rail projects across the country. And we're barely trying to keep ours in good shape. Okay, I threw this in for Joe. He has this. He gave a lecture here, right, Joe? And your self-powered car here, or something like this. And it's got a little thing, and it takes the energy out of your car, and uh, you know converts it. And I'll leave that. Joe said this. Even though this was, what is it? Even though this was predicted way back in the 50s, I think they said it was only they didn't have the metallurgical skills or perfections and able to do it. But it, it yes, you get the momentum, like say you come to a parking spot, it will somewhat store the energy for when you start up there. Okay, and this is not, um, talk about vehicles producing your own energy. Being a choo-choo train guy myself, here is one thing that came up, is that here is a design for a high-speed train, or any passenger train for that matter, and in essence it's producing its own power. And it's producing power in much in excess of what it actually needs itself. Uh, so you could, the, the notion about vehicles and energy is real easy. Either there's a central source for energy, and it, that's converted to the vehicle, or the vehicle produces its own. So I'm kind of inclined towards this myself. But there you go. Okay. Oh, what happened? I didn't get any sound. Yeah, you did. Very much. Started. Hey, hey. Because All right. Anyhow. That's um, one, of, one of my predictions is, oh, you can hear it, there you go. There'll be a network of high-speed regional. They'll begin on regional bases. Uh, this is in progress. They're all over the country, uh, and they're accelerating here. The Chinese, if you've seen the news, have just opened the longest uh, high-speed rail thing. It's a thousand some miles. Uh, there's plans, and the, they're even putting a high-speed train, I was at a public hearing, across Iowa. And I met some guys who want to put a high-speed train in Boise, Idaho. I don't know where they're going to get passengers, but they seem to think there's a demand 
for a nice expensive high speed rail and for to give the boys the idol. But uh, it would probably be uh, what they call higher speed in the regions and then you will connect regions, uh, let's say Chicago to New York, and that'll be your high speed train. That's a, the, way it looks, the way it looks like it's headed. Um, I was, actually, there's another thing, uh, we'll switch all together. Uh, everyone's got this pain in the neck. I must have scraps of paper with all the passwords I have for my terminals at work, and I've always got to change these and things like that, and different systems. But anyhow, um, this guy here, this is, you're going to get rid of all these passwords. This is, this is probably going to happen pretty quick. Whether or not it exactly happens in this fashion, I don't know. But uh, my ID for my employer, I have a chip in my ID, gives all the data, and I use that for other applications. This is already in progress. Uh, I use that ID card for multiple places. And it's kind of a nuisance, but this way, I don't know if I could go to my employer and ask him to have it implanted in my forehead. <laughs> like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth the try. I'm not getting losing it. Anyhow, anyhow, I did do it to my cat, Jesse, though. He's got one in him, and I just thought I'd throw in some pictures of uh, my cat here with him. I think he can, anywhere he goes, he's, that's what they do now. If you get a cat at the shelter like I did, uh, they charge you 40 bucks, and they put the chip in there. And anybody who finds Jesse says he's, he's, they have to go see Chuck Paydock. You know, that's his cat. Okay, here. Oh, regarding population, the common thing is, I wonder how big is the population of the earth? Matter of fact, we've been talking about the population. One of the first speakers I ever scheduled at the college many, many years ago was on the population, Bob. And we're going to reach at least 5 billion humans. And these people are going to move into urban areas. What? As a matter of fact, I, I don't think there'll be any rural areas, so to speak. They're declining. And I know that demographically, rural areas are really disappearing here. Um, but this is going to cause problems, because when you concentrate, you end up with an increase in the greenhouse gases as much as one fourth. So there is going to be an influx here. That's what I mean. It ties in to my prediction of public transportation. Okay, just to show you one of the things, this is a railroad station in China. Uh, it, I, I think they're geared up for a little passenger travel. Uh, that's a more, I never counted all the all the aisles in there. But that's significant. That has to be the largest one I've ever seen of a railroad station. Um, advertisers are going to have us so figured out that you're not going to be bothered with unnecessary advertising. They're going to finally fine tune this, and so that you don't have to be bothered with seeing ads and so forth. This is this is the economy of of information is coming in. They're finally tuning this so. It's going to be customized as well to you. Um, this is uh, this is social apps. This is a serious one here, and there's going to be. I mean, I don't want to focus too much on it, technology, but there are going to go people say no, we don't like this, and the anti-technology movement will grow. Uh, people are getting enraged about the emergence of new technologies. The threaten, it's going to be threatened. You see the Tea Party already. Uh, there's something here. They're not, they're saying, they can't handle some of these issues. That's what I mean. They're being debated in Congress. There's the arguments about this. Uh, scientific literacy and things like that. They want to pass legislation. All the dangers, the genetic, you know, all sorts of areas here. Uh, anyhow, it's going to be, and the worst thing is, if Code Pink gets involved, we're really in trouble. Because these women are wild. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, this is the things that likely to happen. There's my neighbors, by the way. Oh, you're crazy. 
my worthy neighbor. Anyhow, there will be resistance to technology. Uh, part of things also is accelerating change. Frank says in here, there may be uh, greater people will turn to package belief systems. Uh, how well do you handle change? I, I got no problem with change, you know. I, hey, but um, instead of being aware and engaged, they may retreat and retrench. So uh, you may see more of that in here. Uh, the one thing about manufacturing, there's all kinds of things about manufacturing. Like if you want some, actually they can. I actually had a salesman telling me some of these things. Some of these things are already on the drawing boards. Manufacturing will be so. Uh, Basically, in order to produce something, um, the true cost of a product is the amount of time it takes to put its design into a machine. A guy was trying to sell me a machine, and we put throw in a design, and it shoots out a three-dimensional model and things like that. So you can, this has been kicked around for a while. I think we're really headed there, that direction. But that's where manufacturing is going to be. Some of these people are talking about, oh my god. Factories are moving out of the United States, you know, that isn't going to be the case. We'll see some more about factories, by the way. So we ain't done, boys and girls. Uh, I mean, there's another thing about religion, not to get you people upset. But I told you we've uh, kind of de engineered the brain. But I came across the thing that you can put a small electromagnet on your front run a lobe here, and then you don't have to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> so you'll be able to experience God right at home, you know. <laughs> oh, this, now this one, I'm not going to get into too much detail, and, but it is intriguing. Anyhow, allegedly, we're going to be able to merge and separate constantly. I don't know who with. <laughs> I'm going to be selective, but we won't be able to precisely ascertain how many people there are on Earth. Now, whether or not this is like, be me down, Scotty, or something, but there is are people looking into this and the predicted. It is possibly feasible, but I mean, we're going to see what happens here. Uh, anyhow, now, we manage to avoid Romney for a while, but he's not gone. <laughs> because there's going to be, with certain changes, a genetic elite is going to emerge. Uh, and this is going to destabilize society, obviously, because you're going to have the new haves and the have-nots. Uh, and we're going to have to set boundaries. Uh, regarding this. And this, I think, is really going to happen. So we're going to be 1% to 99%, but in a, in a very more substantive fashion here. I wish uh, the standard one, I think this is definitely going to happen. This one's a given that uh, there's no necessity for this crazy money. One of the, oh, some other things is the thing are kind of cool. You talk on the telephone and it'll translate for you. This doesn't seem to be too hard to do. But there are only going to be three languages. So they're really not going to be too hard here. Of course, Lithuania is buying to be one of those. Uh, I just threw this in here since we're talking about languages. I ran, do you know who, anybody know who these guys are? Those are the code talkers. I was on the Navajo oh, Reservation. I ran into them. Yeah, they're still floating around the coat talk. I was on Navajos here. Uh, some of the things about a Castro society, we don't have to read all of this. Uh, this is happening more and more today. Uh, one of the very good features we hear about identity theft and things like this, however, counterfeit money uh, is a concern. Uh, a little background in the graphic arts, I can assure you some of the things anybody can do in their office, uh, scanning and things like that, sometimes are the problems only of the counterfeiter. But nevertheless, uh, you can trace money in things of this fashion. There is a plus side to it here. 
Uh, so there, and given the amount of counterfeiting, uh, it's there's going to be a move of governments to get rid of money, at least uh, carrying it around in that fashion. Uh, just another application of the Castro Society being a transit guy. You're going to just get on CTA, you'll have your CTA pass in your watch. And just get on. Uh, this technology is kind of here. They do that on the interstate. And if you want anything else, you can go to the 7-Eleven. Which actually, I was amazed. I think 7-Elevens are these, these stores, like one out of every $25 of sales is in a, in a quick shop place. But you can just pick up stuff like that quickly. Which, uh, now this one, I do one. I'm not a very fashion conscious person, as you can tell. But um, supposedly, you can get in this booth and try on different styles of clothes and see what's suitable, what looks good on you. And then it'll take your measurements and come back in a day or so, and you've got a new suit of clothes. Seems kind of cool, you know. I mean, rather, well, rather than seeing you at the rack as your size or anything. So custom-made clothing should be, uh, there's a, some other reason why that. Wait a minute. Oops, I got to go back. I thought I had more of this. All right. Uh, every time I get the urge to exercise, I go and lie down. <laughs> and I feel like, I like this one here. <laughs> if you need exercise, you just still have a chair. This one, I just, this has got to come. You can just sit down, and uh, it's going to stimulate your muscles. And, you know, better than going to these health clubs or whatever. In you a know, kind of place like this. Uh, medicine, uh, the pill's going to disappear. Uh, you'll have... You'll get air injections, which to some extent they give uh, the things today. Um, but there's also going to be experiment with personal enhancement stuff. Uh, this isn't going to be the realm of the Olympic guys any longer. Uh, but they're much more looking into this nano device type situation here. <clears throat> so we're looking towards enhancing our, our physical being much more so than simply the, the curing of illness and things like this. There's going to be a more positive direction towards health care, uh, anti-aging and things of that nature. Uh, I drew this in for Andy uh, regarding, well, everyone's got to say, what's going to happen in house standard one year? But I thought this was kind of neat. There's all sorts of prediction that we're going to live in paper houses, like the three pig, does the pig have a paper house? I don't know. Um, but you're also going to have homes that are responsive to weather. Uh, they have bacteria made out of bacteria. I collect water and sunlight and things like that. And that's just an indication of what the new homes, they'll be living homes, things of that nature. There's all sorts of green technology. This is all paper house, which I thought was kind of cool. Recycling. They're actually putting them up there. There's houses in India people are living in. They call them cabins. And things. But I was thinking about this. This isn't a new idea. Come on. He lived technically in a paper house. I mean, it was wood. So what's the big deal there? I like that old lady visiting his mom, I guess. Anyhow, uh, politically and, and the political side, economy, China is, China's not going to make it. It's not going to happen. Uh, and it's showing its signs right now. They have structural weaknesses of society. It's not going to work. As a matter of fact, it's going to fabric. It's going to fall apart. Uh, there's corruption, there's treatment, things of that nature. Uh, it's going to be a chaotic. They're going to have major problems, major problems there. And so you're not going to see the progress there. Let's see. Now there's another one here. I have Brother Joe. My friend and I often talk about this. Factories, you know, are moving from this country. First they moved to the South, then they moved to China, then they moved to Asia and South America. We said, why don't they just put factories on ships? 
been moving to the third world country, and there you see some people will mistakenly welcome the factory ship to their country. <laughs> okay. Uh, Diana, you're in archaeology. I want to throw this in for you. Uh, all of the archaeological sites of Wolbe have been plundered. And people digging up artifacts and the, the, the black market and the stuff like this. So uh, all of these discoveries, there's no more King, King Tut's out there and things like that. I'm sorry. Uh, they've been pillaged here. Oh, I threw this in. Now, why does this have to do with archaeology? I'm the railroad state. I'm in Axiom. There aren't a lot of us, but I'm in the Railroad Station Historical Society. And we went to this station in Oklahoma, and we photographed it and looked around. We were visiting various stations. And I pulled up a guy, and he said, this station was abandoned or closed by the Santa Fe Railroad in 1963. <laughs> and we fixed up the outside. But nothing has been done. We've not touched anything in inside. Would you guys like to go around inside and see what's in there? And actually, I did, and I found labor union contracts on the desk. <laughs> so this is a station that has never been plundered in uh, Oklahoma here. All right, this might be good for you guys. Uh, electronic stimulants. Are going to replace alcohol and drugs, Ooh. and because you can customize your own utopia. I don't know my utopia would be like yours, but you can <laughs> actually you can if you're a nerdy kind of guy, uh, you can muck around with this stuff, and uh, I don't know you'll feel a lot better <laughs> afterwards or something. But. I think if I was this guy, I would turn to some sort of drug, though. <laughs> oh, forget it. You capitalists. Oh, libertarians, just small businessmen, small business. If I hear a small businessman from the Republicans anymore, I'm going to get ill. They're not going to exist anymore. There's a homogenization going on in, in our society. One mall looks like my sister was going to move to Arizona from the suburbs here. I said, oh, that's rather intriguing. You're going to substitute a colder, uh, uh, a colder suburb for a hotter one. It's the same thing, no matter where you go. It's true. There's no difference. Uh, here, the last little thing. Here's a little blast of the independence. Uh, it's going to cave into Dunkin' Donuts. Their big boy coffees are excellent. I do recommend that. All right, the nuclear family, forget it. I like my family on the internet. Actually, my relatives <laughs> have pretty much abandoned me. So the only family I actually have is on the internet. It already happened. Um, they don't even send me emails. I don't understand. <laughs> but anyhow. Uh, it's even going to change housing, things like that. Now, I don't know if we're going to have virtual partners. I don't think that's quite all there is, but I don't know about having a virtual. I want a real partner, I think. But anyhow, you can think about this one. And the summer, if this is already happening, we know that from transportation have had it. Uh, no one's going to be moving in the suburbs. Uh, they're going to, the, uh, 55 percent of the poor people in the metropolitan area in Chicago now reside in the suburbs. They're on the decline. Oh, uh, regarding warfare, we have some peace people here. Uh, there's not going to be the, uh, two army kind of wars anymore. Uh, third world countries are not are going to use third world tactics. Uh, now whether or not we have armies like these guys, I don't know. Uh, but that's the type of conflict if there are any in the world. Well, fronts. Uh, we got to get back to energy here. I should get these in order. This is, I've actually come across this in several versions already. Uh, 
this guy wants to produce energy by tra passengers on public transit. And it is feasible. There's something about this about cars passing on a road. And it generates electricity. Uh, so there's going to be some other methods in this. I, I've read some, so many things that the United States is on the cutting edge of the technology of alternative power here. But uh, allegedly, 30,000 people can train enough power and get me home tonight on the brown line. Anyhow, getting another fashion thing here. Uh, fast fashion. I don't really know all this, but a fad, fast fashion is, is out. That's going to go away. And people are going to be looking towards uh, quality. This, this at one time was more the marketing of the old Sears Roebuck. Uh, quality goods uh, were their thing, and they weren't on the fashion style here. This is the next generation of robotics here. We're almost done. Uh, machine vision is coming in. So that's like the next generation of robotics. Not only do they think of sense objects and things like that, that's the last realm of human beings uh, that there is. Uh, another version of clothing is, is that your fabrics, if you're done with it, and it's, if it goes out of style, you can put it in hot water and it will dissolve. <laughs> and there's my friend Lowell. Chesapeake again, taking a little nap <laughs> in my dryer. <laughs> Anyhow, Doctor saved us. This is in plain. How come? What's the speaker on you? <laughs> yeah, that was from Dr. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, robots, we're going to lose. They're going to win. Um, oh, ah, da, 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 that's the thing. Uh, they're going to... Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and the last one, these guys. Oh, the dollars. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, uh, returning again, the energy, hydrogen. This is one that's really, there's, there's all kinds of fuels kicked around. But I found this one really intriguing. A bone is where it's at. And... I can agree with this, uh, but ammonia is going to be the next fuel uh, of choice. No way. Um, no way. No way. Hey, wait, one fool at a time. Yeah, though. that's all right. Yeah, let's keep keep. keep yeah, going. I'm the expert. He's not. <laughs> oh, uh, let's see. Oh, this is another. Actually, this getting back to the implanted thing. Um, and I think this is a good idea here. You. You'll have sensors and things of that nature, whether or not they're a permanent feature of you, certainly if you're not feeling well, but um, the technology of the hospital room intensive care is going to be miniaturized and you can go with you or have it at home like that. Um, networking, this is the, like the internet, email, Twitter. Uh, I think the lobbying efforts, this is, this is really going to be where it's at. Social decisions, uh, free speech issues are going to be a concern, but certainly communication in that regard, we have to throw something in about that. This is probably going to happen around 20 to 40, the shortages are going to kick in. So enjoy yourselves, boys and girls. And this just talks about certain things. Uh, rare earth elements, things of that nature, 20 to 40. Um, you all, and people are going to be get, I'm sorry, they're going to be increasingly illiterate. Uh, concepts of illiteracy, the traditional ones won't apply. 
Uh, education is going to change and things of that nature. I don't know about this one, but we can kick it in. Yeah, I, I'm still sold on the books myself, just from our book fair. I was thinking about it. I'm waiting for the day when some kids show up at my door and say, Mr. Paydock, we found these in the attic. I think they're called books. And we heard that you still remember how to read. Would you like to have them? <laughs> Anyhow, here's another one, and I wish I had done this before. I had to spend an hour making a silly PowerPoint. You can convert instantly to multimedia. Actually, there's some versions of this happening now already. But anyhow, that didn't mean it's increasing. Uh, this one might be controversial. We're almost done. I'm running over. CO2 is the bad stuff, right? Well, conversely, guys are designing plants. It's been verified. I've heard from the places. They're, the agriculturalists are designing plants that will thrive perfectly on this stuff. And the oddest thing is they're mucking with the temperature inherent to plants, like the, the clock or the, the thermometer that's in plants, um, and altering that so that plants, let's say, can with salt, uh, uh, cooler conditions or hotter conditions. So this is, this is really mucking around with the stuff here. Okay. Um, let's see. All of a sudden here, mm -hmm. all the workers of the world weren't anywhere the same. Uh, companies are going to expand their area of recruitment, area of consideration it's called. Um, whether or not they get all the, it's, it's a toss up. Are they ever even going to make the same money? Or is the disparity between the rich and poor going to get greater? I don't know. Uh, this came across as an union. I, regardless of what happens, we're all going to be headed down Union Street. Nope. And, uh, but I do think that people are going to seek an alternative in the next century. And this was predicted, or, uh, they're talking even as soon as 2020. People are going to head it between this 1% and 99%. They aren't going to buy that anymore. They're picking up the figure that 2020, the disparity between the rich and the poor in the United States is so egregious that people aren't going to put up with it anymore. And um, one last thing, whether or not this, you were talking earlier, well, we won't see it. Yes, we will see it because you can be immortalized in this laptop or who knows where, but uh, you can mix yourself in disappear from the environment. Anyhow, thank you very much. Okay. Joe. Okay. All right. Uh, Joe, Joe Meyer, you wanna, are you ready to talk? All right, Tim, you go get your presentation ready. Let's welcome Joe, Joe Meyer, our next speaker. Okay. Okay, Charles, that was a magnificent presentation and you covered almost everything that everyone has ever thought of. I think it's a great idea. Uh, my brief presentation without PowerPoint is going to be from the perspective of me writing a century from now, uh, looking back on the important headlines of the previous century. That is the period from 2013, from 2013 to 2113. Um, so number one, the 2013, the world economy falls into deep depression. Uh, the U.S. unemployment rate reaches an official 55 percent. China imposes mandatory mandatory welfare payments on 800 million former workers step in the right direction. In 2016, U.S. President-elect Michelle Bachmann orders surrender of the Obama administration. 2019, 
President Bachman orders the U.S. armed forces to shoot to kill violent protesters. That's us. Um, Europe, United Europe President Jacques Chirac III establishes concentrated work camps for the unemployed in Europe. 2023, President for Life Bachman appoints Linton B. And P. Andy Anderson head of the Central Intelligence Agency. Anderson's new book, Conspiracies Proven, becomes mandatory bestseller. The International Workers of the World President, Inge Singh, approves automated nanotechnology for production of human necessities, food, housing, medical care, and so forth. Now with the change because of the international workers of the world taking over the world, uh, the uh, international science workers discovered the true nature of space-time. That's very important. Um, the international science workers also discover anti-aging processes. Life extension becomes indefinite. Um, William Wendt establishes planet-wide elevated monorail system. He's asleep. Uh, in 2036, the first launch of interstellar discovery fleet. This is quite possible because we now know the nature of um, space-time. 18 in, uh, in 2037, 18 interstellar spaceships return with volunteer members of intelligent species from 15 exoplanets. In 2045, Earth's orbital period is approved intergalactically by an inter interstellar panel as a common year. In 2054, the Intergalactic College of Complex organizer, Charles Paydock, presides over the 4,000th gathering of the weirdest intellectual beings in the galaxy. <laughs> Now, in 2113, wastewater filter cleaner Mitt Romney commits suicide and donates his brain to the International History Museum. Yay. Okay. All right. Okay, let's have a warm round of applause for our new speaker, Tim Bolger. Yay. Well, the computer is still booting up. I just want to make it real clear that I will make this very quick. And we'll make this very uh, fast. I'm going to be covering a little bit more on a serious note tonight uh, on our College of Complex uh, Predictions. As soon as this uh, speech boots up, we'll be on our way. Okay. And we should be good to go in just a second here. As you can see, our modern PowerPoint is coming up with no trouble. <laughs> All right, and there we are. We haven't had much technology trouble tonight, but as we move on, we're going to do it. The first and foremost, and hang on here. <coughs> Get this. Uh, Right up to we start the beginning. Sorry about the delay in technology here. I thought Joe would have gone just a tad bit longer, but well, it's all right. Air is human. We really better consider. All right, there we go. The first thing I want to tell you guys about is something called innovation, and basically, what is innovation? Innovation is a process of taking new ideas to satisfy customers. It is a conversion of new of knowledge into product into new products and services in other words the whole under fundamental driver of our technology has been the process of innovation and it's not to be confused with creativity they are not the same forms of innovation there's two of them that come out one is called radical innovation and the other one is called incremental innovation radical innovation is in a form of like when you get a telephone to a GPS unit. Incremental innovation is when you have like a walkie-talkie system 
to a cordless phone, to a cell phone. In other words, each invention builds on another one. And innovation, it is making a difference in our lives. It's, it's all about with globalization and a lot of other areas. It does work on things. And innovation is a key driver of change. It's for ideas with what forms the capitalist system, their monetization, their capitalization, their eventual product and their pop into a market force. It also encourages economic growth because as these ideas become monetized, our lives become better. Remember, it was only 35 years after the invention of the Edison light bulb that it became commercially available to almost virtually about 80% of the country. A short 35 years. I need not mention what has happened with the internet and the availability of broadband connectivity. And of course, with it brings the increasing trends towards globalization. And of course, I expect this trend of innovation to continue somewhat in the future. And again, it's all based on ideas of free trade, of globalization, of many other aspects of this type of thing. Now, a little bit about what is forecasting. We all use it in our lives at some point or another. I mean, you know, when you're looking to marry somebody, you're forecasting that you're going to have a good life, and you hope you do a good job at it. A lot of times you get into a, a career choice, or perhaps maybe you're job or, or how you're going to work with other things and it, it's been around for years prognostication and forecasting the weather I mean it's a necessary part of our lives but if there's one thing that you've got to realize and over this next century what the biggest trend is going to be is that the population is increasing over time and it's expected to increase over time but here's the good news it's also going to make more money per capita per person because we've seen a rise in incomes along with a rise in per capita growth. The last two graphs show population and growth over the last centuries and per capita income grew much faster than the population. Population in 2000 were about six times higher than in 1800 and about nine times higher than that of uh, and the source of that is Jeffrey Sachs, The End of Poverty. Notice the decline, though, however, in population in the last few years. You've seen, you know, here's where you are in the developing nations, and it kind of leveled out. And here you see the population going up with a little bit more leveling out. And there's a real good reason for this happening. From the Wall Street Journal, the cost to raise a child is around $300,000 not including college. Annual child rearing expenses are estimated between 12290 and 14320 for a child and a two-child married couple family in a middle income tax group, which is defined as the mid-before income tax group of $59,410 and $102,870. They're quite an investment, and they're quite expensive. The biggest share of the expenses in raising a child, according to the report, is housing at 30%, filed by child care education at 18%, food at 16%, transportation at 14%, and of course health care at 8%. Don't we all wish that our health care expenses were only 8%? <laughs> Children are becoming a big investment, perhaps for some a luxury good. Every family can have a couple of them, but five or six with the expenses? That's why we're not going to have big families. Most only have one or two. And as you can see, of course, they do grow up. And they do get a little more expensive when they reach their teenage years. But they will be our citizens in the next hundred years. So we must take care of our most precious resources. Less children in developed countries, more children in the developed world, and even that is decreasing. This population trend forms the real backbone of what's going to happen in the next hundred years. And I can't emphasize this enough. This will form the backbone. Everything is going to get better. The world is getting to be a better place. We are living longer. We are getting healthier. We are getting more prosperous as a species. Here is the trends in historical context. If I can just get this uh, speaker going here. I think we can... Hang on here, I think it's uh, going to take a second here, Mike. Right? Mm. We can get it working here. Uh, 
Hang on, I gotta get my technology geek here. Sorry about this. Hey, you want me to hold the microphone? Huh? We'll try this again in a second. Shoot. Wouldn't you know what the sound goes out? It always goes out. Windows 7. We may have to uh, ring this here. Okay. All right, you want me to be ready? Is it in the middle one? Yeah, the middle one. Hang on, let's try it again. You wave your hand in some. I'm actually going to take this and go offline and go to the actual video clip because uh, this is probably one of the more important videos that we'll do. Um, so just give me a second while I get the uh, file, proper file up. Yeah, and I brought my large computer tonight so I wouldn't have these uh, problems. Um, Tim? Yeah. Can you tell us who that guy is that's talking? That guy, his name is Hans Rosling. And what he does is basically, uh, he... The gentleman's name is Hans Rosling. Oh, great. You know... Hey, can, you, can you wing it? Well, what Hans Rosling basically says is that um, the world health and the world population is rising. And what he does is with his data sets, and what I was hoping to choose through this video, was the fact that all, as a whole, our countries are getting healthier and wholer due to the rise of population, due to the rise of, you know, health trends and everything else. And even though there may be an unequal distribution of income, the trends have been rising a little more forward. Now, we're going to try this again with my PowerPoint. But uh, hang on here while I get to the uh, data, because I think what we're going to do is, uh, and as you can see, here's all the data. Now, what we'll do is, uh, yeah, I'm going to pull it up real quick. Where is Hans? Here we go. Here we go. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work, too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an access for health, life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an access for wealth, income per person, $400, 4000 and $40,000. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries, 
Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa South or Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. The United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you just see in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. I would say, pretty neat. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that this is what innovation does. You just saw, basically, in the last 200 years, our story of globalization and what it's caused and what it's done with the Earth and how our lives have actually been increasingly become better. You know, and the thing is, let me find out exactly where it's at here. We'll get right back to it. Sorry again about the technology troubles. Okay. The next part I want to let you guys know about too is, you know, given the trends of the poor, of the um, of the uh, nation in the world and what we're going on, is that a nation state is still going to be the main means of organizing people and culture. That means if you're a Scottish and you're from Ireland, you're going to be an Irish. If you're an American, you're still going to be an American, and because. The cost of war between two major powers is going to be very, very high. I don't believe we're actually going to see it. And yes, I still think the U.S. is going to be the dominant power over the next hundred years. I could get more into that, but in the interest of time, I'm going to shorten this down quite a bit. Globalization's relentless march will continue. The poor 
and the rich will still be there, but the growth as a group are also going to continue. This was one a video that I was going to do there. He's basically saying that um, Thomas P. M. Barnett wrote a book called The Pentagon's New Map, and what he explains is that the United States military has basically gone and done a big change since the end of the Cold War. Instead of concentrating on fighting on large militaries and large military power, they're going to get more involved in skirmishes. More like what we have seen in Bosnia, what we've seen in Panama, what we've seen in Iraq, what we've seen in things. They're going to be involved in nation tearing down and nation building. And what he basically says is that, you know, this is going to be the part where the U.S. Defense Department goes along for most of the, in the, for most of the next years. He talks about the the gap countries, those that are non-connected, that are still going to be having dictatorships and having more trouble. And the core, which is the ones you see in green, which are the ones that are connecting to the world economy. And then the, a lot of the future that you're going to be seeing is that this gap is going to be integrating into these core countries through the spread of globalization. U.S. will be the dominant power over the next century. And uh, Japan, and in the other countries that are going to be rising, I believe the first one's going to be Japan. It's going to be our next Pacific power. Japan is still the number two economy in the world. It is still the very dominant source of information in the world. And it still is going to be very uh, big in the way things move. Again, I had another video here. The other one that's going to be kind of surprising is Turkey. It's going to be the Middle East salvation and a key for growth and peace. Statistically, for the last 500 years, when the Muslim Empire was stable, it was centered around Turkey under the Ottoman Empire. And as the Arab countries run out of their oil and see their wealth decline, it's naturally going to shift back to the Turkish government. Turkey, the Turkish military and their presence have been, you know, are beginning to reassert themselves, and they will be open for open for business and the Middle East will start looking to them as a model to start integration, and it's going to be a good thing, and it'll be one of the key advisors to getting that gap informate, that gap integrated to get, get into the core. Oops. There you go. <laughs> okay. Now, again, Poland is another one that's really going to be kind of crazy, because you see, the Soviet Union is going to want to reassert itself, and it's still going to want to be, in Europe, there's still going to be a little conflict there. So Poland is going to become like the new buffer zone of who had done. Now, and you think you might laugh when I say that, but if you look at it, it, Poland has got some very interesting neighbors. They've got Russia on one side and Europe on the other. And with the flat plains that Poland has, they're more unlikely going to be the next battlefield should conflict ever go again between Europe and uh, Russia. So what America's going to probably wind up doing is pouring tons and tons of massive aid into this country, including F-16s, including all the personnel that go with it, including everything that goes along with it. All I can say is, look at what happened to South Korea. And look again at what's happening to Israel. In 1950, you left your, you left your stacks off. Now, I'm going to keep going. Just how we, are we going to power this future? You know, how are we going to power it for globalization? How are we going to stop global warming? How are we really going to stop people to keep long-lived and healthy? Well, I did have another video, but we're going to watch this real quick. is something that we can go through with it. It's a different kind of nuclear power that I just recently learned about. It doesn't, it involves the, it, it involves the amount of liquid fluoride salts. I wish I could get more into it here, but 
If you really want to learn more about them, go to www.authorityofalliance.com. And with that, we're going to, just to sum up, we're going to see that innovation drives the future. The world is aging because children are more expensive to raise. Globalization will continue its pathway forward. The United States will continue to be the dominant power for the next century. We will see the rise of Japan, Poland, and Turkey. And we will see the world powered by liquid fluoride thorium reactors. And... Charlie. Okay, did we have uh, do we have another speaker? Or is that it? Maybe we should move on to the Oh, Lee, yes. Lee, Lee, Lee King. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Let's have a warm round of applause for our next speaker, Lee Ping. discussion uh, in terms of resources. I also agree that uh, energy is probably not a big issue in the future. Well, if you look at the gasoline price uh, in this few weeks, uh, it drops. And uh, they pre predict in uh, 2013 the gas price will uh, drop further a little bit. But I think uh, for the long term, we have uh, alternative energy in various forms, like thorium or other nuclear, wind power, solar power. So just because uh, in the last few years so we had this uh, energy problem, and uh, then alternative energy all rise up, and uh, they can become re reality, or even part of them can be re uh, become reality then. Uh, our energy can be uh, no longer a major problem. Uh, it can be solved the uh, technically. But the problem will be water, fresh water. Fresh water, the resources is only there. You don't have alternative energy. You cannot drink uh, salt water or sea water. So the water will be a major problem in the future. And also, I would agree, uh, world population growth is uh, uh, slowing down. Uh, many due to the delay and uh, or uh, without the marriage. Delaying marriage, everybody is uh, experiencing that. Uh, when you have more education, you go to college or even uh, graduate school, then the, the marriage average, uh, marriage age. Is, uh, delay and uh, lots of people don't get married and uh, they they become more individualized they enjoy their, their self and uh, they they don't need uh, the kids to have a family life and uh, they they can enjoy life uh, by that way so I think uh, world proper population will slowing down but probably in the next hundred years, it's still increasing because lots of old people are still around. Uh, then, uh, global warming, I think it's, uh, it's already there and it's, uh, it's warming up, uh, uh, except you see today is cold. Uh, but uh, for the long term, it's, uh, it's warm up. And, uh, uh, so, uh, environmental problem will be a, a big problem in the future together with uh, water supply. And uh, the water also affect food. Uh, I don't know how to solve the food problem. Food, uh, and maybe some alternative uh, solutions like eating seaweeds uh, from the ocean uh, may not be very tasty. Okay, that's uh, the technology side. The other side is uh, society. How we live together as a society member. 
And uh, I gave a talk uh, in end of September. We say I, what I said is uh, communication is the key driving force for the last uh, 200 years for the not only t technology but also how the democracy is born and uh, why we have a democracy successful right now instead of uh, 2,000 years ago. And also the technology, the, the society advance that we just heard uh, Tim talk about. Uh, I think that's all be based on the free communication so the knowledge, information can accumulate and uh, then people can think independently and uh, the whole society becomes more diverse. All kinds of people are there, good or bad. Unfortunately, there will be bad people there, like uh, killing people in the connected or killing uh, firefighters and uh, crazy people will be there. But those people will be just individual-based uh, actions that uh, we, I think, uh, that society as a whole will be more uh, reasonable, more logical, more uh, can, uh, April. willing to live together because as a human beings, we are all on the same boat as the Earth. Okay. Uh, in next hundred years, we probably couldn't really uh, move to the other planet uh, to live over there. Not yet. And uh, the society will be more tolerable. Just like uh, right now, people may not everybody promoting gay marriage, but uh, people starting tolerating taller or right, the, the gay marriage, say this is a normal feature and the normal society behavior. And uh, some other things will be tolerable also on the list like uh, smoking marijuana and uh, also I think uh, the next thing is uh, assistant suicide. Because old people get more and more, some people are just tired of living. And uh, if I live, I want to live happily. I don't want to live uh, uh, in bad shape. So assistant suicide will be tolerable uh, soon. And uh, also, based on the uh, society trend, more individualism and the more uh, globalization, people work together globally, and uh, have uh, communication between global people uh, around the world. So I think global war uh, would be less and less, less likely to happen. And also, and there is a society changing so fast, people has less and less respect to authority to your parents, to your leaders, because the world is changing very fast. So I think uh, one type of uh, behavior, like um, religion, loyalty, uh, patriotism, these are very important in the past. And I think in the last hundred years becomes less and less important. People are less and less, less and less religious, less less and less loyalty, loyal to the to the nation, and uh, uh, but in general, the world will be more peaceful. Uh, that's my prediction. Okay. Um, all right, now we'll get into the question and answer session. Uh, if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. So I think we'll do is, uh, tell you what, Charlie, how about if, um, how about if both you and Tim uh, come up here to the, um, uh, uh, here on stage, uh, metaphorically speaking. Uh, and, um, and and you can answer any questions. Okay, first of all, 
Let me just uh, let me just see. Does anybody have? Did Bob? Did you want to say? Bob. Oh, okay. We're gonna have more speeches instead. You got anything you want to add? We got one more. Oh, okay. One more. Okay. okay. Robert Allen. Okay, Robert Allen. Okay, here you go. I guess I will be the voice of dissent. So far, the speakers have all pointed to a glorious, improving future based on technology and rising wealth and rising age and everything else. I don't see it that way at all. So I, in preparation for this, wrote only two sentences for Chuck this morning, and they go like this. The forces, and, and by the way, this is a prediction for 2013. This is not for the next hundred years. I guess I misunderstood what the... Uh, what the predictions were meant to encapsulate. So I wrote that the forces of political spin will no longer be able to hold back an avalanche of catastrophes that are lined up like dominoes ready to topple. Whether cascade failure will be complete in 2013 or over several years or even decades in the future remains to be seen, but the precariousness of our current so-called economic recovery will reveal that our political processes are impotent to address our needs because papering over problems has created a false sense of security and continuity among the citizenry and allowed politicians to accept either stalemate in the political process or active undermining of the political process. That's all I have to say. I'll be happy to entertain any questions later. Okay. All right. All right. Let's, um, all right. Let's get into the. Uh, okay. Do we have any other speakers? Any any more speeches? We go. I guess we got till. Uh, all right. This is predictions, right? Not rebuttals. Predictions. Well, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you know, it's y'all's program here. Do we have any more speakers tonight? So, uh, so we're ready for Q and A. Questions. questions. Okay. Okay. So are we? Okay. So are we ready for the questions yeah. for Q and A? All right. All right. So tell you what. All right. All right. So here's our two speakers. So um, uh, all right. Who, who? First off, who has a question? Bob, go ahead. Uh, Chuck, my question uh, is to. Uh, Speak loud, please. Like yeah, my, yeah. My, my question uh, is, oh, I think I'm going to pass because I forgot what my question is. All right, he forgot his question. Come back to me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want me to just carry the, do the Phil Donahue well, thing? Yeah, carry yeah, the yeah, Michael yeah, Donahue. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ernie. Yes, Charlie, it was very interesting in your talk because many of your predictions didn't be didn't seem to be favorable to your okay. beloved unions. So I want to know uh, what, what you think are going to happen to unions with these with these nano manufacturing and, and ships that go to the cheapest labor market and so forth. Uh, uh, well, I I didn't want to focus on it. I I think um, seriously. I think union membership unquestionably is at a low. But I always think this is the positive side. This is this time for us. There are some demographic things. Seriously, the answer? This independent contractor stuff that emerged with the, the techie people. And there's more and more contracting out. And people will be employed on a contract basis. Um, there's fluidity in the workforce that's coming about. I, I think we're going to have to reconfigure ourselves or how, what is our relationship. Um, you need a buffer though because he's, he's talking about multinational corporations taking over. Uh, perhaps there's going to be a greater reliance on labor law and government, seriously, uh, than the traditional. I just, since I'm at the microphone, I was talking about the chips and I wanted to show I did mention, no, uh, to digress, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think the contracting out relationship scene is, is getting out of hand here. Um, it's the ideal employer because they can terminate, the, the contract is, of course, written at their convenience. You know, but here's the thing I want to show you about CHIP and high tech. This is my work ID, it has my background. Um, um, they did a background investigation on me and all the data is included in here. Anytime I want to turn on a computer terminal, I can go to anyone 
across the United States and the federal government and put this in there, and it will work. Unfortunately, it will be confined only to my files. And it works in multiple applications and doors and things like that. But this is the thing that they, it's a little thing. And talk about counterfeiting, when they, they talk about high tech, we went all this high tech stuff. Somebody went to copy or copied this, put it on a little credit card. So now when you show it, they want to feel that it's actually <laughs> your card. It's a card. But somebody counterfeited one like the first week they came out. Okay. Um, all right. All right, just Bob. Just to, just hold on a second. Let me uh, give you the microphone here, Bob. Okay, here you go. All right. Sorry about my uh, mental lapse for a minute. Uh, maybe Tim might want to get in those last part of the question too. Uh, Chuck, you did mention our ability to control the weather, but you also brought up the issue of climate change. So how can you possibly uh, claim that we can control the weather as we may approach climate tipping points where our, all our climate variables undergo these extremely large fluctuations? And then I might ask Tim in that context whether he thinks the market system itself is really adequate to deal with the issue of climate change. Charlie? Okay. No, right. should, should you start with Charlie? Start with Charlie. Oh, okay, here, here you go, Tim. I don't know what is going to happen with weather control or climate change. As far as I'm concerned, weather control is so fantastic and <coughs> preposterous that I don't think it's going to happen. I do know we're facing global warming. And if it happens in 30 years, we're all going to be hosed anyway. But if we go forward 100 years, we also know too that whether you believe in climate change or not, we're going to have to get off fossil fuels. And we're going to have to go to something else. I firmly believe that's going to be an alternate form of nuclear power called thorium called the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. I've spoken about it here in the past, but basically what it does is it takes the common element thorium, bombarded with a free neutron, it turns into uranium U-233, U-233 produces some more free neutrons, bombards more thorium, and then you have a continuous reaction. The thing produces less than 1% of the fission products that a normal nuclear power does. You have 100% burn of the nuclear material and we can take our existing nuclear waste, throw it into this reactor and burn it up. It's not that we don't have the answers to climate change. This stuff was done at Oak Ridge. This stuff has already been proven. As a matter of fact, the very inventor, Alvin Weinberg, of the light water reactor went on and was fired by the Nixon administration because he said that we are in a Faustian bargain. Now, I'm just I'm going to very quickly say this. That I believe or some other alternate form of technology will find a way for a solution to global warming. It's going to be, again, just like what we've done with the steel industry, just like we did with the computers, just like we did with everything else. They're going to innovate something, they're going to find something that works, and they're going to find a way to power our society going forward. Uh, to getting back to, I don't know, which would you rather have? Chuck's ammonia or his non-reactive thorio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I was when I was growing up, yeah, technology will solve all problems. And regarding back to climate change, the shift in the paradigm, and you know better than me, is not to global warming, it's global shift to global ch or weather change. It's weather shifting. You can end we're gonna end up with droughts. No. Extended droughts, it's already happening, or, or flooding. Boom. And somebody is going to come in, if they got, they've got the technology to control the weather, um, you, you're thinking, they're, they're going to be thinking of themselves. Or are they going to be thinking ethically in a global situation? Hopefully the decision is going to be on a global perspective. If you get the wrong guys, unfortunately, like the guys we didn't elect, in the last election cycle, if they got in and they controlled the weather, what what the fuck do you think would happen? <laughs> okay. All right. Any any other questions? All right, uh, Doug.
Doug Binkley. Just a minute. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get to you in, in a moment, Mrs. Yeah, Charlie. Uh, oh, just, just talk. Here, here. Go ahead. Take the mic. Uh, Charlie, we were talking about uh, robotics and nanotechnology, uh, but you didn't discuss the possibility of the uh, gray dust or the gray goo uh, result from that. I could you explain further? Gray, gray goo is all these nanobots get loose and then they destroy everything because no. they're <laughs> right. They're, you you they're trying to do stuff and they just destroy I, the whole thing. I have to defer to you, sir. Right. I don't know what gray goo is, but <laughs> it sounds unpleasant. Everything. We don't want gray goo in our society. Yeah. This, <laughs> all right, all right. Just Tim. I'm 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 not a nano nano guy. Expert. Okay. Tim, 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 do you have anything to say about gray goo? I hate gray goo. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I, Next wait a question. minute. And it's, I didn't focus a lot on the technology. I I try to throw societal things, oh, okay. and I think that's more my area. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, now, Mrs. Bolger, okay. you had your hand up at about the same time as, as, as Doug. Here you go. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, you were talking about your precious unions, and then you were talking about how we're going to be living for maybe till 120 or 150. How the heck are we going to pay for all the old people and their Medicare? Okay. Um, all right, Charlie. Uh, how, you, okay, tell us how we're going to do that. You, you take from the rich and get to the poor. It's simple. You, when you work your entire life to make some guy rich, right now under the present system, he says, thank you when you get old, and he says, I will see you around sometime. Now, whether we do that legislatively, with your collective bargaining, I don't know, but you got to stop this. Workers. You make some guy rich under the capitalist system, and he says goodbye, adios. And that's a very negative trend that a, a retirement system, such as an independent freestanding one like I will enjoy, is, is almost non-existent in the workforce. The figures are alarming. The people got to stand up and say, no, this is there, there's a race to the bottom, let's face it. And they get, you're gonna, if in the solution sense, they're making no effort whatsoever uh, to coerce the, the employing class from assuming this responsibility, the burden is what going to fall on in the individual or uh, the government. It started with Reagan, 401k. What the hell is a 401k? I want a retirement plan, not some num num alphanumeric. That, that, that's not what I'm talking about. We're letting it happen. I, you know, yeah, it's not cool. Okay. I'm going to say this. Retirement is a very recent invention. And the retirement system of Social Security was never meant. It was started at age 65. We can thank our medical technology and everything else for the advancement of our lives and for the extension of those golden years. But I also know, too, that people are probably going to have to work a little bit longer than they're used to. To retire like some of these private sector, people, public sector people do at 55 is a little bit crazy. Why? Well, Charlie, because, you know, working 20 years at a job, they still have 20 years of, of work life left in them. And if you want to go into a job and retire at age 55 and under that contract, you should honor that contract. That I agree with. However, you have to remember, people, you know, you need to be productive. You need to have a good life. And if you can afford to retire, please do so. But please, if you have a present contract and you're trying to pay for that contract, you're going to have to honor that contract, which is what most people are doing. But I also believe, too, that we're not going to see retirement in the next 100 years as we did. You're just not going to be able to retire at 55 and live to 100 and have half your working life being paid for by somebody else. The trends are just not there. You're going to have one worker supporting four old people under our present standards and it's not sustainable. I don't care whether you take money from the rich or not. The only way that you're going to get a pleasant retirement system is through job growth, through capital expansion, through economic growth. That's what's going to do it. 
Okay. Um, there's uh, enough wealth right. right now for everyone to retire at probably about 40. Okay. Um, all right. This guy tells me to put a yoke on and work more. What are you okay. doing, Ty? All right. All right. Listen, 150? All right. All right. Listen, we got we to gotta keep things moving along here. All right. Who else, who else has a question? Okay. Uh, Ma'am. Okay, just a moment. Let me let me come over there if I can if I can get through there. Okay, here you go. My question is regarding it's not so much a question but a sta statement where you talk about. Oh, the oh this is a time for questions. If you want to. Well, this is a question regarding your data. Okay. Yeah. That where you're, you're you're showing data where they talk about the difference in, in the healthcare and the healthiness of the population of uh, 200 years ago versus now. Um, I think you're pro you might possibly be dealing with apples and oranges because the health care was so different 200 years ago and now. For instance, people died of strokes before we had the drugs in the 50s. Um, people are artificially kept, and then that's a term that's not going to be accepted, artificially kept alive because of medication, because of heart. What's the question? The question is, I think your data is skewed and flawed. Um, I thought it was really not a question so much as but a let me answer that's that. not really more of a statement than a question. I just would like to remind everybody else that if you have a statement to make, if you want to, if you want to demonstrate uh, that that our two speakers are full of it, uh, you can do so by coming up here to the podium after the question and answer session is over. Uh, okay, but uh, did, did you want to did you want to respond to this uh, accusation here? I don't think the data is skewed at all. What Hans Rosling did was he took the average lifespan 200 years ago, the average lifespan today, and I do agree with you that the reason that, that life extensions happen is began because of the increasing in medical technology, the benefits of drugs, and many other things. And I thought he showed that data quite well. If you really want to dig into it, uh, that clip that I showed was from a, BB, from a BBC4 special called The Joy of Stats, the gentleman's name is Hans Rosling, and the data set that he's developed is a rather unique thing. Check out TED.com, T-E-D.com, -E and check out Hans, H-A-N-S, Rosling, R-O-E-S-S-L-I-N-G. And, and trust me, I want you to check it out. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, who else has a question? All right. So you, sir, in the back. Just a moment. Okay. Here. Here you go. Uh, this were good uh, uh, commentaries and speeches we had in, in predicting the future. There is one thing that uh, Mark, uh, I think. Mark, I, yeah, point the microphone towards your towards your thing. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's that's. I, the, I, I think they have missed one point though. Uh, in calculating the population, if any one of you have taken microbiology or biology for that matter, and you incubated a petri dish with microbes, and you watch that, and put his, the, the colony of the microbes are growing and growing, all of a sudden they stop. Oh, so, sir, did you have a question? Yeah, or? that is, that was both of okay. them. And uh, because they didn't mention anything of it. And why did they stop growing? Because of their own waste. And the same thing applies to us. And none of you have mentioned that. We are wallowing in our own waste, and that is going to cut on our population, not increase it. Toxic, we're going to poison ourselves before we reach what you are predicting in 100 years from now. Can you comment? I will. Oh, yeah. Oh. There's opportunity in trash. Do you look at what waste management is doing right now with recycled materials and products. Half of our aluminum comes from aluminum cans and recycled aluminum. A lot of our raw materials, including plastics, are now being recycled. And a lot more uh, a lot more materials are being recycled every day. I agree with you. We, have, we produce a lot of waste. But in order to burn off that waste, we're going to need power. And I've already explained what that power should be to take care of things. I also believe, too, that through the process of innovation, 
somebody is going to come up with an idea to use that waste and make it a potential revenue stream, thereby producing jobs and cleaning it up. Maybe the free market doesn't work every stinking time, but it, I'll be put more faith in that than I will in uh, some obscure doomsday prediction. Okay. Will you send somebody to pick up my old Wait, wait, one, one fool at a time. I, I, don't, I don't buy into this waste. The regarding population growth to UN, we're going to have a speaker on this, the UN agenda. Uh, right now, they're trying to see to it that every child on Earth gets one cup of food per day. Uh, we haven't quite achieved that standard, so I don't think we're to the point where you've got, they're not grown up yet. Um, yes, with increase, I don't want to get in demographics of children, but there, it's, it's, I don't perceive waste. When you say we, it's going to preclude the population, it's food, nutrition, life expectancy. Uh, most kids don't have clean water and don't reach maturity. That's, but they're going to be demanding that first thing. Uh, it's coming in, and I don't think waste is the issue right now. Uh, the other thing is, people are going to want a piece of the action, and they're not going to settle for living in a hut, and there's going to be social disharmony. Uh, that, I think, is more the primary concern. They, you know, they're not going to live down on the farm, and they're going to be exposed to the Western culture, and going to want the features of the, of the lifestyle. And how do you contend with that if you don't produce it? Or if you produce it unequitably? And think, now the worst thing about population, I'll just say one more last thing. The one thing that really causes problems regarding population is the danger that the, your children, the next generation, will not have a lifestyle equal or exceeding the parent. That causes instability. And that's what I think you might be facing. That's what you really got to be afraid of. Anytime my children might not survive or make it or achieve my level, then there's a problem. People look for change. Right. Okay. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, one question. <laughs> All right. All right. Way uh, back. Okay. Who's, oh, somebody, okay, way back there. Just a moment. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Bob. Oh, he wanted to rebut it. Okay. Good. Did you have a question, Lawrence, or did you have a have a comment? Okay. I was wondering if you had any updated information. I glanced at an article about solar photovoltaic cells, and they had said that the current ones were using like only gathered the blue light blue light rays, which was thirty percent efficient. And supposedly there's something that gathers the red light rays that's one hundred percent sufficient. I was wondering if that's you know anything about that? <coughs> Where's Andy? Where, you know... He's, he's having a discourse. I, uh, he's right there. Yes. Okay. Ask Andy. Excuse me. Andy, come on up and answer this question about solar energy. Okay, here you go. You were asking the question about uh, are, why are some solar cells more efficient than others, capturing more of the light spectrum? Yes. Is that the essence? Well, they're working on panels that are becoming more and more efficient. They're going through the same kind of industrial uh, process that happened with expensive cell phones getting cheaper, expensive computers getting cheaper and better. The whole solar industry is going through the same learning curve. I brought a flyer with me. Uh, there's a company in Arlington Heights that's advertising solar cells, uh, solar power. Uh, you get up to an 85% rebate on the cost of a system with current federal and state and manufacturer rebates. People in Illinois and in America don't know that solar power is viable and usable today. And uh, Germany has already put up enough solar panels to shut down 20 nuclear power plants. Uh, the current, at current prices, if they don't drop, solar energy is approximately 10 times cheaper than any kind of nuclear power plant, and you can get 10 times more energy online in the same amount of time, 10 to 50 times faster than building any new nukes. That's All it. Right. Thank you. All right. All right. No problem. Um, and thank you, Andy, for answering that question. Okay. Now, I I had a question for you, Tim. Okay. All right. You use the term globalization a lot in in your in your lecture. Uh, what is globalization? It's the process 
by which a country advances itself economically. It is the integration of one country's economy into another. It is the... There was a good definition on Wikipedia, and it really escapes me right now. I can just tell you this. It is the sum of the representation of our current economic capitalistic system where it integrates one country into another. Uh, we've seen globalization or the expansion of ec economies and the integrating of those economies on a worldwide scale, thereby increasing prosperity for all. It just simply means the integrating of one of the economies into a bigger economy and with the increasing of a network system, you're able to bring more prosperity. Okay. Uh, uh, did, did I answer that? Yeah, sure. Sure. Oh, but, but I was just asking. I was how just in the asking. world have you put up a switch up on the third world country and you show up and say, oh, we're just bringing prosperity to your village? Because those jobs, Charlie, were probably better than the being on the peasant farm in the first place. No. Okay. Uh, all right. All right. Um, all right. Uh, did, it, it was, uh, did somebody else have a question? Did somebody have their hand up? Diana Lubitus. But in who is uh, okay? Uh, all right, all right. Any other? Um, any? It's Ten o'clock. Anyway. Does anybody else have a question? Oh, uh, Ellen. Okay, just just a moment. This will have to be the last question. Okay, go no ahead, Ellen. Question. See. Um, I came a little bit late, but did anybody address the issue issue of desertification, where um, more and more areas are becoming like deserts? Um, yes, they do. And yeah, especially Asia. Africa, and and how are we going to have? How are we going to have enough food crops for everyone um, with more desert desertification? Okay. All right. Uh, who wants to respond to that? Charlie, you want to take a stab? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, I did have a thing on the expanding desert areas in Asia and Africa. And uh, I could say that, you know, the in technology of horticulture, but I think we're all going to have to learn how to share. Okay, uh, Tim, did you want to say anything about that? Again, I will go back to my old argument that you have a good, cheap energy source, you can power an industrialized society, and that through interconnected worlds and other items like that, we will see the desert bloom. We're already seeing it in, in uh, Arizona right now, Las Vegas. It costs a lot of power to do it, but I think as the world gets a little bit better and a little bit more integrated, we're going to see a bright future. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, you don't have anything to worry about. Agri-business likes us all and will provide us with food. Oh, <laughs> they oh, want to do it. Oh, okay. All right. Monsanto. All right. All right, folks. We're going to, that's going to have to be it for the questions now. So let's, once again, have a, let's uh, have a big hand for Tim Bolger and Charlie Tata. Okay, okay, folks, we're going to get into the rebuttal speeches now. So those of you, uh, those of you who, would, who, who feel that, that one or both, speak, both of our speakers is all wet can, can get a chance to say so now. And um, now I just want to, now first of all, let me just tell you how it works here. These are the on-deck chairs here, um, and we already got some gentlemen who are already ready to give rebuttal speeches. Uh, and so you just come over here, start at this end, and work your way over to the right. Now, uh, I would just like a show of hands. How many people in our audience would like to give a rebuttal speech? I'm gonna, and I want, want you all to keep your hands up, okay? So I'm going to count the people that are in the chairs already. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm going to count myself seven, eight, nine. Keep those hands up, people. 10, 11, 12, uh, okay, I count, okay, I'm counting 12 people, um, so four minutes each. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Oh, how are these guys going to rip us apart, man? <laughs> <laughs> four minutes, I'll keep counts on this. First thing I'd like to say, I'd like to welcome these young people here, this one guy over here in the uh, hat, another young guy over there. Probably uh, three, five of you are under 
30 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, you wear glasses. Well, this kid's got glasses on too, but that could be fixed. Um, I used to wear glasses. I don't wear glasses anymore. Uh, I just got back from a month in Ecuador. I flew out of Guayaquil to Panama City and then into O'Hare. When I got to O'Hare, I got down and I kissed the carpet because I was back in the United States. Ecuador is basically an open toilet. They have no sanitation there. They have no potable drinking water. They boil all their water and make it uh, usable. But their immune systems have developed through urine therapy, which every country in the United States is taught, or, I'm sorry, every uh, country in the world teaches their young children urine therapy. They take a small amount of their urine each day and bulletproof themselves and their immune system with the antigens that come into the body and then become antibodies. We're all here because of dirt. As little children, we crawled around on the carpets, we bit our nails, we put our hands in our diapers, okay? And that's how our immune systems were started and completed in our early 20s. And then as we eat and drink these chemtrails that are dumped on us every day, the uh, chemicals that come out from the exhaust of buses, cars, hot water heaters, airplanes, our immune systems continue to get stronger and stronger. Okay? Now, do you want to jeopardize that? Do you want to take drugs that your immune system will go after and try to get those out of your body? That's up to you. See your doctor. Okay? Now, we're going to get rid of 800,000 doctors, I'll tell you right now. In the building that I'm in, there are three first-year medical students and an intern. In his, uh, he's in his fourth year of medical school. These four children, I call them, are being brainwashed into writing prescriptions for every symptom out there. It's called symptomatology. You and you and you and you and, and me are suffering from a lack of drugs. When you have a symptom for something, that doctor looks at that symptom and goes straight to, straight to a drug. When they come to Doc Mike, you get a therapy, okay? You might want to pick up on your magnesium, on your vitamin C, uh, change your lifestyle. Where's Charlie? I want to have another cigarette, okay? Now that's got to be one of the most stupid things. I haven't had a cigarette for 30 years, and I was down to three packs a day the day I quit 30 years ago. That's how I paid for all my lawyers, keeping me out of jail. It worked for a certain number of years, and then, I, then they tagged me, okay? But I'm back, Jack, with a brand new Cadillac, okay? Uh, one minute. I've got one minute left. All right, I'll tell you a little something about, more about Ecuador. The nutrition over there is very poor. Coca-Cola is king for pregnant mommies. I cannot describe in days of... Um, reiterating what I saw down there of birth defects for these little children because of vitamin and mineral deficiencies in these little mommies, okay? Now, sex is kind of open down there. It's a, it's a, 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 breath, a, what a, a feather in your cap for some guy to date someone, get her pregnant, and then dump her. There's many beautiful girls down there walking around with one or two kids, no husband. And this guy's out, you know, spreading his seed. That's their culture, unfortunately. Okay? And I'm going back. This, this was my third visit. I'm going back again. They can't wait for me to come back there again and share my medical knowledge. Okay. Thank you very much. Happy New Year, too. species that it eventually is going to be able to solve its problems and work its way out in a positive manner as a species. 
But as I look at the present situation, uh, I think what we have done is create a situation in which we can destroy ourselves very, very quickly, and we uh, can destroy ourselves more slowly. A few um, weeks ago, I was attending a conference at the University of Chicago about nuclear power. Uh, nuclear power plants produce uh, byproducts which are radioactive and cannot be stored safely. Uh, there is no way in which these byproducts can be dealt with chemically. Uh, if they accumulate indefinitely, they're simply going to destroy the human species. Uh, this reactor, uh, which Jim talked about, I do not think exists as a successful device. I it was think built it at Oak Ridge. Not exist. So, it does not so exist so. any more than cold fusion exists. <laughs> these things are so contrary to natural physical laws and will not work. Uh, nuclear power can destroy us if we do not get rid of nuclear power plants. But more quickly, nuclear weapons can destroy us. And that is what we have set up, which uh, threatens the imminent annihilation of the human species at any moment. Uh, this is described, the explanation for it is in this little leaflet, the uh, Noah Gay and the Apocalypse occasion, which I passed out a little bit around the room, and I'll have it over here, and it's over there and back. Uh, it explains why the nuclear deterrent uh, strategic systems that have been installed are going to catastrophically fail. Uh, that will result in the destruction, if it's an accidental failure, perhaps a major city, instantaneous destruction, annihilation of several million people, and the radioactive contamination of a vast part of the countryside. That is a catastrophe absolutely unprecedented. And it, that is if we are lucky. If we are lucky, if we are not lucky, we're going to have a missile fired, say, which will destroy 10 cities or a salvo of several missiles in which a country or a nuclear submarine will let go with its arsenal and an entire continent will disappear. That is if we are unlucky. But one of these things is going to happen. And it will happen, it can happen at any moment, and it will happen eventually. All right. If you want to make predictions, you go to science. The person who has been most successful in making predictions of interest the general population is this chap. Is it Nathan, his first name, who writes for the New York Times and predicted the outcome of every election in every one of the 50 states? Nate Silver. Silver, fine. Now, how did he do it? He did it by mathematical statistical analysis. Uh, he was scientific. He used the method which he knew worked. And he was successful. If you want to know what's going to happen to the human species, you apply the same type of approach, a scientific, rigorous one, to the systems which have established. Are they stable? Will they work? If they don't work, what are the consequences? We put in these missile systems, nuclear missile systems. You can, you can determine by means of mathematical probability analysis what their failure probability is, and you know that it approaches certainty over time. That is, we face the annihilation of the human species at any moment. Now, as I say, I'm basically positive because I think that since this is understood and can be avoided, we can be avoided by deactivating these missile systems immediately. If that is not done, it can be uh, achieved by after the first catastrophic event, then we can deactivate them. But we have to deactivate them if we want to survive. Oh, yes, and if we want to have enough time for other speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, Gary, what about you? Uh, he's uh, after here. Here. Yeah, I'm right. We get four minutes, Brown? Yes. Well, I have to say, um, Again, uh, I welcome young people. Anybody under 50? Who is under 50 in this crowd? That was a show of hands. Anybody under 50? <laughs> we got three people here under 50, and uh, one of my wishes for the new year is that we find some way to make the College of Complexes more attractive to younger people. This, this could be a great forum for exchange of information. But I suspect there's not a lot of young people here because the Forum for Information yes, is many times not reality-based, it's fantasy-based, like what we heard tonight on a lot of key predictions. Uh, you have to... Many of tonight's predictions are based on the ability to ignore very large segments of observable reality. 
things that have been known, solidly proven, undebatable for 30, 40, 50 years or more about human nature. Uh, the economic, military, political, scientific fields, all of these things have huge bodies of information uh, that show us where we're going, what's possible, and what's not. There's huge agreement among scientists in many countries all over the world that if our future does not dissolve into catastrophe, if we have a future, it belongs to solar, wind power, wave power, renewables that are divorced totally from the fossil fuel industry and nuclear power also. Nuclear power is a separate issue. I'll get to that in a minute. We are pouring a trillion dollars a year down the military rat hole at eight or nine hundred bases around the world. We spend more money on our military than the rest of the world, all the other countries combined, and our military people are coming back depressed and committing suicide because they're learning that they're not defending American freedoms. They're not fighting for freedom anywhere in the world. They're keeping the world safe for the fossil fuel industry and the extractive industry, mining. Okay? So, Smedley Butler, for those of you that want to read a small book on this, General Smedley Butler, a Marine General, blew the whistle on him in 1935. His little book is uh, about 70 pages. It's called War is a Racket. And he summarized it. He says, I was muscle for the mob. I wasn't defending freedom anywhere in the world. We were defending the American corporations, what he referred to as the mob. That's where we are today. The third point I would make is if you wanted to intentionally destroy the global environment and get rid of the bulk of humanity as fast as possible, the only thing you need to do is pour money into nuclear power plants. Because if you pour money into nuclear power plants at a time it will suck up money that could be used to do something about global warming and climate change. Mm -hmm. Today, at current prices, solar, wind power, wave, well, solar and wind power, essentially, those two are very well developed. They're 10 to 50 times cheaper and 10 to 50 times faster to deploy than any kind of nuclear power plants anywhere in the world. Uh, talking about nuclear power as a solution is the same thing as if um, a man went into an emergency room with a cut artery and the, the doctor says, uh, you're going to bleed to death in four minutes. Another doctor says, here, I've got, I've got, we've got a salve that you can put on that and it'll coagulate the blood and stop the bleeding. That salve will be ready in six months. <laughs> patient's going to bleed to death in four minutes, but we'll, we'll have this ready. That's the essence of the nuclear power uh, theory boiled down to uh, a nutshell. The last thing I would mention, log on to Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, Rocky Mountain Institute has been talking about 100 mile per gallon cars since 1980. Houses without furnaces that heat for 10 bucks a month. A whole variety of solutions to the fossil fuel industry that we have. And uh, there's a bunch of houses in Schaumburg with no furnace. They've been here since 1979, heat for 10 bucks a month. Thank you. Okay. Anybody want some information on that, come see me. I've got some cars on the website. Thank you. Uh, to answer a few uh, a question that was asked in the past, what about the uh, efficiency of solar power cells? Uh, presently, they're in the neighborhood of between 12 and 18 percent. Some of the modern technology uh, that has been discovered is the use of quantum dots. The present solar cell uses a very narrow section of the solar spectrum in order to generate electricity. But the quantum dot takes the a much larger section of the solar spectrum and changes it so that it is now accessible to the, uh, the solar cell. So they, they can reach 35% and they'll be available you know, in 2013. Maybe not in large quantities, but certainly they will be. Um, what about water? You asked about water and food and so forth. There's some recent developments um, that show that in desert plants, there's a fungus that lives among the roots. When they transplant that fungus to ordinary uh, plants growing not in deserts but anywhere else, the quantity of water that they use dramatically drops so that you can use the, the fungus, which doesn't harm the plants but enhances the growth of the plants, to grow any plant any place in the world. It's a marvelous thing. It was in uh, the New Scientist, I believe it was the November 18th issue. A British publication. 
Um, the fluoride thorium thorium uh, reactor was answered by our an esteemed colleague from uh, Hyde Park. Uh, it, it's not a, a great device, uh, it, although it initially starts with a, a small amount of radioactivity uh, necessary to get the reaction going. It eventually builds up very, very large quantities of radioactive waste. Um, Tim mentioned implicitly how wonderful capitalism is. and. Um, Unfortunately, he ignored the uh, traditional and well-established contradictions of capitalism. Capitalism has changed from 120 years ago to today. It, it would be unrecognizable to a person in the 1860s uh, if that person were alive today. And the amount of money that's generated is far, far in excess of what it was 100 years ago. I'm Michael Foley. I'm not going to say much tonight. One thing I'm going to say is that I'm not good at predicting the future. <laughs> For about the last year or so, I'm a guy that's been saying that the guy who gets sworn in as president next month is going to be Rahm Emanuel. And it don't look like that's going to happen. So that was my last prediction. But anyway, one thing I can say about what I think is going to be happening in the future is what is what has been happening for a long time now. I also say you can't believe our politicians or our government too much because usually they lie to us. But I also say sometimes they tell us the exact truth. And one truth that we have been told for the last 11 years is that the official policy of the American Empire as carried out by the United States government is eternal war. We've been in war probably since before this country has started. Sometimes it heats up, sometimes it cools off. But for the last 11 years we have been in all-out war in Asia and other parts of the world. And I fully expect that it's going to continue until the people of the United States of America are absolutely flat-ass broke without a dollar in their pocket. Because that's what the American Empire wants to do to the people of this country. Eternal war leads to impoverishment. We're spending trillions of dollars, literally trillions of dollars, building things and blowing them up. They're called bombs or whatever. About a year ago, our country announced, I was surprised I even heard it, I only heard it on the news one time. Our country, our government announced that the United States Armed Forces has sent 100 combat soldiers to four countries in Africa. About a week later they announced that in addition to those 100 combat soldiers, they sent all the thousands of support soldiers, supply soldiers, medical soldiers, administrative soldiers, blah, 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 blah. Our country likes to use, our government likes to use the phrase combat soldiers so we don't get too upset or too excited. Anyway, these soldiers are sent to Uganda, Central African Republic, Congo, and the fourth country was either Chad or Southern Sudan. <coughs> By chance, yesterday I heard on the news that there's some kind of war going on in Central African, Central African Republic. It's been going on for several years. A bunch of these tribal guys having wars with each other, various tribes, factions, provinces, whatever. And the announcement came through the news yesterday that the United States Armed Forces, Special Forces troops, are hunting some kind of warlord in the Central African Republic. So the United States of America is now actively involved in shooting, killing war in the Central African Republic in Africa. One minute. Okay. Well, the only other thing I wanted to say was there's about three billion people living in China, India, and that other part of Asia. Hundreds of millions of these people are involved in farming by hand. Any kind of mechanized farming is going to cause enormous unemployment in that part of the world, which just will lead to essentially a greater unemployment problem for the whole world. 
Unemployment is another thing that depresses people's standard of living. Unemployed people have a tendency to put pressure, downward pressure on wages. So unemployment really is going to be a serious problem in the economy of the world for as far as we can see. Last thing I want to say is the people in this country love what's going on in this country. The vast majority of people in this country love being violated by their government, love being oppressed. Okay, Bob. A month ago, 120 million people went to the polls and voted for the Democrats and the Republicans, which are the ones who have brought us to where we are. Thank you. Hundred and twenty million people do. Hundred and twenty million people do. Oh, they voted for it. Yeah. Okay. Let, let, well, let, 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 yeah, it's all interesting stuff being talked about here tonight. And there's all sorts of things that could be said about various specific issues that have been raised. I don't have the expertise to judge the prospects for something like thorium. I don't have the expertise to judge the prospects for something like thorium. But I've got a pretty good education in my way. I was fortunate. And what I've been studying more than anything else over the past almost 50 years now is American political culture. And what I have to say to you folks tonight is even if we solve all of the specific sorts of problems like the energy problem with something like thorium, what I don't hear anybody talking about, least of all on the boob tube, is the crisis in American political culture, which is, by and large, a crisis of the boob tube and the other media, the mass media in this country. To give you an example, just an example, of how grave the crisis is, consider that a few years ago, a movie called Inside Job won the Academy Award for Best Documentary. Among the extremely significant scenes in that movie was one which showed a certain Ben Bernanke on national TV telling the country, hey folks, don't worry. Housing prices never go down, meaning either they stay the same, more or less, or they go up. Well, I forget if this was in 05. It must have been 05, give or take a year. So within, at most, a few years, housing prices decisively refuted that prediction. Now, I don't know how many Americans took Bernanke's advice and therefore either held on to a home they were considering to, of selling or bought one that they otherwise might not have bought. But it seems likely that millions, certainly thousands, maybe millions of Americans, were affected by the advice of the Bernankes of the world and lost thousands, maybe hundreds of hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions. And what's so significant about this situation is that here we are, seven give or take years after Bernanke said this on national TV, and it's not just that Bernanke still has his job, but it's that I have nerd, never heard of any major pundit on TV or any place else even reminding the American people of what Bernanke said then. Hmm. And even making any kind of argument that because of this catastrophic prediction that he made, catastrophic for catastrophic for possibly millions of Americans, that he should lose his supremely cushy job, presumably one of the cushiest in the whole country. So we cannot evidently find anybody better than that guy to be in that job. And yet, that's the impression we're given, and we're being kept in ignorance as to that one piece of history, and no doubt five or fifty or five hundred other supremely significant pieces of recent history. We're being kept ignorant of it by the folks in suits and ties on the media who imply to us 
Oh, don't worry. Things are going to be either more or less as good or better than they've been. I guess that means I'm out of time. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. I enjoyed hearing Charlie's predictions of the future, but some of them sounded a bit like too much like the gee whiz predictions of the future that we heard 50 years ago when I was in grade school, where they were talking in those days about how everyone would travel on monorails and we would have flying cars. Remember the Jetsons, the kind that yeah. you um, took the flying car and folded it up into a little briefcase that you carried with you. Right. Um, for the most part, I will wait and see what, whether, what Charlie and, and uh, Tim said come true. The only other thing that I would add to this is the following. Um, there was some criticism here in the room. We talked about how retired people's retirement plans are, how we're expected to pay for people's retirement. And I will say simply this. Sixty years ago, we had a president with whom I, in retrospect, disagreed with somewhat, but who was nevertheless an outstanding leader. His name was Dwight Eisenhower. And shortly after President Eisenhower took office, the leaders of what at that time were called the old guard of the Republican Party, the new House Speaker Joseph Martin, the new President Pro Tem of the Senate Stiles Bridges, the new Senate Majority Leader and Majority Whip Bob Taft and William Nolan, and our own state Senator Everett Dirksen, among others, went to see the president. They said, now we're going to dismantle the New Deal and all this stuff. Yeah. And the president said to them the following, that he wasn't going to start any new social programs, but he was not going to take away from the people what they had already been given. And he went on to say the following, of great interest. He pointed out that the Republican Party, our party as he called it, was the minority party. If we want to meet the majority party, the President Eisenhower said, we have to remember that it's not 1860 anymore, and that, if, if, and that if we want to be the majority party, we have to live in the modern world with everybody else. And at a subsequent discussion, the President said that if the Republicans want to be the majority party, they have to stand, for, they have to stand up for three things. Social Security, Unemployment insurance and a farm program. Thank you. I got it, Don. Oh, okay, Tim. I got, got it. it. Yeah, I got it. Very good. I'll time you, Prom. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, really don't have very much uh, to say. Uh, I predict that uh, churches and possibly unions uh, will uh, develop circles of 10 to 12 members who confess their fears and hopes to each other, uh, maybe have uh, dinner once a week together, and uh, they, they talk about their economic circumstances and they pray for each other and uh, for uh, their churches, their unions, their, uh, their neighborhoods, uh, etc. Uh, and I think that these circles will be very important both uh, to the unions and to uh, the churches. Uh, I, I, also expect that churches will uh, find that they are being, they will be more and more taxed. Uh, Good. Yes. Uh, and uh, then I, I want to recommend a book, uh, I think it's called Occupy uh, the Economy uh, uh, by uh, 
Richard Wolf and uh, Wolf with two F's uh, and uh, and somebody else I forgot the other guy's name if I ever knew it. Um, uh, he predicts that. that uh, that will that is quite possible that we will come to a revolution because uh, the uh, capitalist economic system is falling apart, as we have seen. Uh, it should be interesting. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Doug Binkley. Um, yeah, um, somebody once said uh, prediction is uh, very hard, especially about the future. <laughs> uh, what, yeah, there we go. Um, when I was researching uh, Nostradamus um, for a book I was writing, um, uh, and I uh, encountered a book in the, uh, uh, the remains um, pile, and it was published like something like 1989 or 90. And uh, uh, they thought that they had uh, cracked the code of Nostradamus. There was a special code, and so they had everything figured out. They had so they had the predictions of exactly what was going to happen. And, and they took a real chance. They predicted at that time that uh, uh, George H. W. Bush was going to get reelected in 1992. So <laughs> that didn't pan out for them. Um, yeah, uh, Charlie and. Uh, and um, Tim were uh, both uh, fairly optimistic about the future. Um, when I mentioned about the gray goo, uh, that was uh, one of the pessimistic ideas of what could happen. Uh, Charlie was going on about uh, robots uh, uh, and um, how they it might be helpful as uh, uh, personal assistants and that uh, kind of thing. We already have these apps um, on um, smartphones and that kind of thing. Um, um, people have been predicting artificial intelligence for quite some time, um, and um, I once uh, wrote a play uh, which was produced uh, in uh, 1991, uh, uh, went on at the Avenue Theater shortly up the street, uh, a few blocks up the street here, um, and uh, that involved um, the possibility that there would be um, artificial intelligence would arise um, in the near future at that time, I mean, it would have been... Um, uh, considerably over 20 years since then, but uh, the um, the idea was that the program would be developed called Socrates, and um, uh, at a certain point you could ask Socrates anything. So um, you could ask Socrates about the thorium reactor <laughs> because it's a very complicated thing, but Socrates would be able to um, crunch all the data and uh, uh, arrive at um, a balanced, uh, uh, wise uh, um, answer to. Uh, uh, whether it'd be a good idea to uh, do thorium reactors or not. Um, what we're facing is, um, uh, the long and the short of it is that the political powers that be did try to destroy Socrates and they thought they'd uh, succeeded. So it was a parallel to the, uh, to the ancient uh, drama of the original Socrates. And, uh, the question we have is, uh, as we approach uh, the future, is whether that artificial intelligence is going to be coming along in those uh, robots that are going to be built, that are going to be more sophisticated uh, than those that we have, uh, whether they are going to help us or harm us, uh, whether we'll be able to make uh, the wise decisions um, about what to do about global warming and um, about um, hopefully reducing the danger of the nuclear weapons, as has been mentioned. Um, um, and uh, I go back and forth, but I continue to think that um, um, hopefully we will, um, with or without the assistance of um, artificial intelligence programs as they come along, um, that um, at least the 99% will mitigate the, uh, the bad effects of the 1% and that we will be able to continue to, uh, to survive as a species because we have dodged a lot of bullets, um, especially the very big bullets that we dodged in the, uh, in the Cold War. Um, and if we can just uh, be lucky enough to um, Make some wise decisions in the future. We will have at least a chance uh, at a better, a better uh, world. Thank you. All right. Okay. Who else? Who else has a rebuttal speech? No. Okay.
All right. Um, you know. Oh yes. Go ahead, sir. Come on. Come on up. Uh, I'd just like to say that if you find that your teeth are not as white as you'd like them to be, look into gray goo toothpaste. <laughs> All right. <laughs> really? Or call us at one eight hundred. Gray goo. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, this has been a very interesting presentation tonight. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that we had that we had um, after I set the time. After I said four minutes for everybody, I was looking down at my. Um, I was looking down at my timing table and I realized that I actually, we actually could have gone five minutes for everybody. It was, that was my bad. But, so, so, sorry about that, folks. But we were, it's off by one digit. It was off by, it's actually, it's actually, if it's more than, if it's more than, if it's 13 people or more, then it's four minutes. Okay, but in any case, in any case, I, um, this is a very interesting presentation because now, uh, for those, you know, those of you who are regulars at the College of Complex and have been coming here for a long time know that, that, that Charlie has for a long time been uh, an outspoken advocate of socialism. Uh, whereas Tim, um, who's also been a regular at the College of Complexes for a long time and, and uh, has, is, is, uh, has tended to be more an advocate of, of capitalism, in which the two things that are frequently thought to be polar opposites. And, but hearing, uh, you know, I remember a guy who's not with us anymore. His name is um, J.J. Jameson. Some of you may, some of some of the old timers may remember him. He was a college of complexes regular, a talented poet, and as it turned out, a convicted double murderer. And he once said something that was very perspicacious, that I thought was very wise to me. He said he had never met an anarchist who had not taken money from the government. So much for anarchy. He also said that he had never met a socialist who hadn't at least once been in business for himself. So, so much for socialism. And so, uh, but I noticed that, there, that the two speakers actually had a lot in common. First of all, they had what essentially was, in my view, an optimistic view of the future. I don't yes. exactly agree with everything Charlie said. That, and some of the things I don't know would be all that good, such as the loss of privacy, I would have a problem with that. But in general, that technology would improve and that we would come up with solutions to our problems by and large. Um, and, and Tim had the same view. And in fact, that their, their views are very similar on what lay in the future for us. Um, neither, both of them talked about, about human society and technolo technological advancement, not about the environment, which has already been brought up. The fact of the matter is that we, this planet that we live on, the Earth, is the only planet that is known to be inhabitable by us. The others in our solar system uh, do not have an environment that can support us. We think we're superior to the environment, but the truth is that we cannot live without it. We depend on a healthy environment to live, just as much as, as blue whales or elephants or white rhinos. Okay, And if, if our environment fails, we too shall go extinct. Now, um, so now, I tend to be very skeptical about predictions for the future. Um, I don't believe that I believe that the future is not written. I don't. I don't believe in the Marxist concept of historical inevitability, or the Calvinist concept of predestination. I don't. I don't believe in any of that. Um, I. I. You know, I would like to quote Ben Franklin, who said that nothing is inevitable except death and taxes. <laughs> I do think people are going to continue to die, and I think we are going to have to continue to pay taxes in some form or other to some government or other, some kind of entity. I would also just want to predict, I would also like to just quote the famous engineer Murphy, who said that if anything can go wrong, it will. <laughs> and, and finally, um, man, some of you may know Erskine Caldwell writing in a, in, a, in a book called The Book of Predictions about 30 years ago. Um, uh, he wrote the play Tobacco Road. He said that new technology will not cause neighbors to become more friendly. And I think we can pretty much count on that people are not, it's, it, this, these microphones and video cameras and smartphones do not make us morally superior to our ancestors. And 
What's in the future? I think it's up to us, all of us. I think the future really depends on what we do. The future's not written. It depends, it depends on the choices that each one of us makes. And uh, that's all I have to say. They say the speaker gets the last word. I'm here to tell you that I believe our world is going to be undergoing rapid change, rapid economic growth, and how do you cope with it personally? I mean, you know, we're going to be we're going to be having all this incredible change of new jobs being made, old industries dying, and the world of change is, is going to be upon us in a bigger way and more faster breathing and going. How do you cope with this in your own life? Well, the best advice that I've ever heard on this subject was from a gentleman by the name of Thomas M. Friedman, the writer of the infamous book, The World is Flat. And he said that those people who learn to love to learn are going to be those who ultimately succeed. And if you want to know how you can learn to love to learn, if you just remember back to your favorite teacher, and how neat it was to learn a new topic. How neat it was to learn a new thing. I can tell you with personal experience that, you know, I have a couple of hobbies. You know, I work in a small business in Franklin Park that sells products on eBay and Amazon. But, you know, I've taken the time to learn the art of video work. I've also taken the art and the time to learn about public speaking through a group called Toastmasters International. And I can tell you that because of that volunteer work I've been doing, and because of the skill sets of work that I have been doing, I have learned to love to learn. I have learned to love the art of videography and movie making. I have loved to learn the advice and the art of getting a good presentation going. And I believe that the, those fundamental skill sets are going to translate into something else. So if any of you have any real want to know any way to cope with the future, find your skill set. Learn to love to learn. Let's hear the end now from Charlie. Oh, I definitely <laughs> been fun. I've learned from all you guys. Uh, the thorium thing, listen, the, the, the nuclear stuff produces the purest form of pollution. It's colorless, it's odorless, small, minute amounts will kill everyone instantly in this room. And to say, well, this is a technology I think we should pursue. No, I've got to stop a minute and, you know, think about this. You know, I, maybe this is... I mean, I've often told the story that nuclear waste on the railroad, well, the engineers didn't, they were transporting the, what I call nuke juice. And they had big containers of nuke juice. And the engineers didn't like it near the engine. So they moved them to the back of the train, and they said, we don't like this nuke juice because it's hot. Yeah. And I told this story before, and I thought they meant radioactive hot. Okay. No, it maintains a temperature of 600 degrees for centuries. Now, you want to produce nuke juice like this, and he hit on it. What do you do with this stuff? You know, honestly. No wonder that I got to, you know, thank Tim, you, you spent a lot of time and effort here. I got to, I can't rebuttal my own thing because it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but I must say, I've spent a number of years in the United Nations Association, and, and I like I like international affairs, but I I I really got to stop a minute and say that the future the international relations of the world are based on what occurs in Poland and Turkey. Um, Turkey's the sick man of Europe. It has been and still is. And much as I like Poland, I mean it's adjacent to Lithuania and this is a shared culture. I just can't perceive Poland. And the other thing is, sir, if you're going to show a map, which 
you had in the northern part there, the, where's Lithuania? But you showed it as part of Russia. <laughs> and it's an independent country. It is not a colony of the Soviet Union. And perhaps you should update your thing. Anyhow, we had a lot of fun. Now you guys all want to get serious quotes. We must maintain a receptive attitude towards that type of change and complication, which is sometimes called progress. Thank you. Thank you all. You got a map that says I'm a swimming at it. I'll hear about 100 years so that a few years can